Hello class, I'm back. Uh, this is lecture number 30 for History 101, and we had left off with passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in popular sovereignty being applied to the Kansas and Nebraska territories. So we want to look at the first real test of this, which happened two years later in 1856, and that's what really spurred on that heated debate where Senator Sumner was caned by Brooks. Now, what's going to happen here, you want to take a look in your book on page 407 to really understand this. Uh, Kansas, the state of Kansas, just as uh, Senator Douglas had hoped, was quickly populated and was applying for statehood. So according to the premise of popular sovereignty, before they could do their finalized application, they had to hold a public referendum where they would vote whether or not to enter as slave or free. Now, it was pretty well known. Most of the people that moved to Kansas were anti-slavery and that when the votes were tallied, it would vote to enter the union as a free state. So, they held that election, and what's going to happen is a group of people known as border ruffians will cross over the border of Kansas from the state of Missouri, and they will basically illegally participate in this public referendum on popular sovereignty, and they will distort the results. Wagon load after wagon load of border ruffing, ruffians cross into Kansas and cast votes. And when the votes are all tallied up, slavery wins. Now, everybody knew this happened. And the way it could happen, you got to think about it for a second. Kansas is still a territory. They aren't organized like a state. They haven't had any state elections yet. This was a real loose election without voter registration or anything like that. So basically anybody who showed up could vote, including a whole bunch of people who were pro-slavery from the slave state of Missouri. So <clears throat> this distorted the results. Congress knew this happened. Kansas sends in a application for statehood from a meeting's held at, at a city in Kansas known as Lecompton. And <clears throat> this creates the Lecompton controversy. Congress basically tells these individuals, you got to change your application and your proposed state constitution to eliminate slavery. We know what happened. We know you're not a slave state. So this is what turns into Bleeding Kansas, as it's known. <clears throat> if you take a look at the highlighted map here, the first instance of violence that erupts over this issue of slavery versus non-slavery, and you can see <clears throat> a red bomb denotes an attack by pro-slavery forces, First one happens on May 21st, 1856, <clears throat> when pro-slavery uh, armed individuals go to the city of Lawrence, Kansas, which is a stronghold for abolitionists and anti-slavery advocates. They march into town and start murdering people. They attack the town. Many men are murdered in this. And this is a, the, a horrible event which leads us to referring to this as bleeding Kansas. In retaliation, just three days later, on May 24th, 1856, you'll notice <clears throat> on that highlighted map, anti-slavery or free state forces go to the pro-slavery city of Pottawatomie Creek, Kansas, and they retaliate for the attack on Lawrence. And eight 
pro-slavery people are murdered. And the person that carries out this attack by free state forces is the famous John Brown, the radical abolitionist. He and some of his sons and other free state forces go and avenge the deaths of Lawrence, Kansas. Then from that point forward, pro-slavery people are murdering anti-slavery people and vice versa. Really, a lot of people argue the Civil War actually began in Kansas. And these are the first lives lost in the Civil War, even though officially we won't have a war until 1861. So now we want to cover the election of 1856. And we do have a chart contained in our textbook that shows us the outcome of that election. <clears throat> that election, uh, as you can see, there's no Whig candidate running. The Democrats are going to nominate James Buchanan as their candidate. The brand new uh, Republican Party will nominate uh, Major Fremont of Mexican-American war fame uh, as their candidate for the uh, presidency. He is an ardent, even on the binge of being radical abolitionist, and he makes no bones about it. He wants to end slavery. Now, we also have a brand new flash in the pan uh, third party that really has nothing to do with the issue of slavery. And that's the American Party. The American Party, who will run former president and vice president, Millard Fillmore, as their candidate, <clears throat> is all based on immigration. And uh, they're better known as the Know Nothing Party. Let me tell you a little bit about this party because the name of it's one of my favorite. The know-nothings is a good term for many politicians. <clears throat> they came out of this group known as the Order of the Star-Spangled Banner. They were a group that was very prominent in the Midwest. All of them have been Whigs and they're anti-immigrant. They're mad about the immigration that's happening, especially they don't like Irish Catholic immigrants. So that's the whole basis of their party. They're anti-immigrant. And the Order of the Star-Spangled Banner is sort of a secretive society. And when any member of that society is questioned as to what do you really do at your meetings and so forth, their standard reply is, I know Nothing. Thus, that's how we get the name of the Know Nothing Party. Obviously, they don't fare very well. And uh, even though they do get 21% of the vote, they're sort of leftover burnout wigs. So, Buchanan prevails in this election because of the division and the fact that the Republicans are brand new. Most historians agree, had Fremont won the Civil War would have happened shortly thereafter because he was hell-bent on ending slavery. But Buchanan wins, which is really going to delay the war for four more years. So the next thing we want to cover is starts right on that page and carries on to the next page, which we really want to look at. That's the famous trial of Dred Scott versus Sanford. So let me tell you a bit about this trial and why it really shocks abolitionists. Now, many abolitionists didn't want a war. They just wanted the end of slavery, but they wanted it to happen peacefully. And they were under the assumption if we could ever get a case to the United States Supreme Court challenging the institution of slavery, the constitutionality of it, how in the world could the court say slavery is constitutional? It smacks against 
all the premises of our democracy contained in the Constitution, and especially the Declaration of Independence. So, all hopes were put on, we can transcend out of slavery through Supreme Court decisions and a gradual sort of elimination of the institution. That's sort of a nonviolent solution to it all. So the case that's going to be brought forward that all these abolitionists were putting their hopes on is the famous Dred Scott versus Sanford decided upon in 1867. If you look on page 412 in your book, there's artist depiction of Dred Scott, his wife Harriet, and his two daughters. Here's their story. They're slaves, and they're all owned, all four of them, by an army physician. Now, originally, he purchased the Scott family in Missouri, where slavery was legal. But as everybody in the military, he's transferred from time to time, and he's going to be transferred at one point into the state of Wisconsin and another point in the state of Illinois, where slavery is illegal. And uh, so... What the attorneys representing Dred Scott are arguing, how in the world could Dred Scott be a slave anymore? He was held for a prolonged period in a state where slavery was illegal. So thus he would become free because there's no such thing as a slave in these states. So it goes to the United States Supreme Court. Everybody's got their hopes up. Here we go the court's going to rule slavery unconstitutional. Well, they didn't get that far. In every single Supreme Court case, they consider an issue before they consider any of the surrounding facts. They have to determine that the person involved in the controversy has what's known as legal standing, meaning they're in the right court. Did they exhaust all their possible appeals? Because you got to work your way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, do they really have a controversy and so forth? If they decide yes, which they do in most cases, then they proceed forward with the case because they've established what's known as legal standing. The Supreme Court basically says in Dred Scott, Dred Scott does not have legal standing in this court because he's a piece of property. He's owned, and property cannot sue anything. So they dismiss the case because Dred Scott does not have legal standing. So let me explain this to you a little bit further in common terms. Could your car sue you for not changing the oil regularly? No. Should you change the oil regularly? Yes. Could your house sue you for not properly maintenancing it? Like letting the roof leak until it ruins the entire house. No, your house can't sue you. This is the logic of the court. Dred Scott's piece of property, he can't sue anything. When this happens, the abolitionists are highly disappointed. Radical abolitionists like John Brown and William Lloyd Garrison just throw their hands up and say, well, Guess we're going to have to fight to end this nonsense. We're going to go to war over slavery. So the next thing we want to cover is what's going to drag us right into war. And that's John Brown's famous raid on Harper's Ferry. Now, this is covered in your book on pages 415, 416, on to 417. And uh, let me tell you the background information on this. John Brown is a radical abolitionist. He got his first taste of blood in bleeding Kansas. After Dred Scott, he decides, I got to do something to trigger this war. We've waited long enough. We've got we to gotta fight over this. So he comes up with a plan where he and some other rad radical abolitionists, including uh, his sons, will travel down to Harper's Ferry, Virginia, 
Now, in 1859, it's still Harper's Ferry, Virginia, because West Virginia does not exist. There's a very lightly defended federal armory there where there's a giant stockpile of weapons. Here's what Brown plans. He's going to go there, commandeer the armory, get access to all these weapons, and then a slave revolt will happen in the state of Virginia. Because before they do this, they're going to get the message out to slaves, hey, us abolitionists are taking over this armory. Come to Harper's Ferry. We'll arm you, and then we'll all revolt against the state of Virginia and slavery. So, in 1859, this occurs. Brown and his group of radical abolitionists easily take over the armory. The next step is the slaves are supposed to start showing up to be armed. Well, Brown and his men are waiting. The town's panicking. <clears throat> They're waiting and waiting for the slaves to show up to be armed. In the meantime, a train, this is a major ra rail area, <clears throat> steams into Harper's Ferry on its way to Washington, D.C. Some of Brown's men go and commandeer the train. They won't let it go forward because passengers were getting on board, and obviously they'll notify officials in Washington uh, that the armory's been commandeered by radicals. They hold the train for about 12 hours. They know after that, somebody will become suspicious, so re they release the train to make its trip from Harper's Ferry to D.C. <clears throat> In the meantime, they're stalling for time. When are these slaves going to show up to be armed and start this revolt, which is our main uh, idea to trigger the Civil War? All told, one escaped slave shows up. The reason why? They're too afraid to. They know if they're captured on their way to Harper's Ferry or captured involved in a slave route route or revolt, they're goners. They'll be killed by these angry Virginians. There's no doubt about it. So, train gets to D.C. People warn the government what's happened. The military immediately dispatches a military group to go out and take back the fair, uh, the armory. That group is led by Colonel Robert E. Lee, who is part of the United States Army at this point. Lee leads the men to Harper's Ferry. They retake the armory. A uh, couple of Brown's sons are killed in this battle, John Brown is wounded and he's arrested. He now is going to stand trial in the state of Virginia for treason because he tried to start a revolt against the state, and that's treason, an armed revolt. His trial is a circus. They don't even give him time to recover from his gunshot wound and in fact, he's wheeled into the courtroom in a hospital bed, and he's tried from a hospital bed. The notion is, we all know what the verdict's going to be, and we know what the punishment is for treason. He will hang. He's quickly found guilty, and he's sentenced to death. Now, John, on the day that John Brown hangs for treason, all across the North, everybody knows what time this is going to take place. Church bells are rung in his honor. He becomes a martyr. In the South, they're going, what the hell's wrong with these people in the North? He attempted treason and he got exactly what he deserved, a death sentence. It shows how divided we are. To one group, he's a martyr. To the other group, He's a convict getting exactly what he asked for. John Brown's funeral train will take he and his sons back to his home to be buried. 
That's the John Brown Farm near Lake Placid, New York, in the shadow of the ski jump today. That train's going to take him all the way to Virgins, Vermont. He'll be ferried across the lake on a ferry that used to go from Virgins over to where Camp Dudley is near Westport. He'll be put on a wagon. That wagon will then take him to Elizabethtown where he'll lay in state in the county building overnight. Then the next day he'll be brought to his farm in North Elba where he and his two sons will be laid to rest. You can visit that site today. It's a state historic site. You can visit the graves of John Brown and his two sons right here in our own backyard. So that didn't trigger the Civil War right in 1859, but it's going to trigger it very quickly because look how divided we are. The next big thing we want to take a look at is the election of 1860. <clears throat> and the map that shows us that's on page 419. The country's highly divided by this point. And as you can see, there's going to be a whole host of candidates running. Abraham Lincoln's going to emerge out of nowhere and become the Republican nominee for the presidency. The Democrats are going to be divided up into two groups. Frederick Douglass will represent the Northern Democrats who are not, you know, pledged to slavery in any shape or form. Breckinridge will be the Southern Democratic uh, candidate who is definitely pro-slavery. Then you're going to have another candidate, John Bell, for a brand new flash in the pan party, the Constitutional Union Party. Their whole premise is to preserve the Union, not have a division and a war. Now, because the Democrats are all divided up, Abraham Lincoln will win this election easily as far as the Electoral College vote is concerned. But as you'll notice, he'll receive less than 40% of the popular vote because the other three candidates divide it up. So, Abraham Lincoln is elected, and this is interpreted by the South that the first thing he's going to do when he's sworn in his march is start the process of eliminating slavery like Fremont had promised four years earlier. It's unclear if that was really the case, but we'll never find out because the South isn't waiting around to find out. In fact, they'll start seceding from the Union. Now, uh, the first state to leave the Union in December of 1860, just you know, a little over a month after the election took place in November of 1860, is the very radical state of South Carolina. Now, if you look in your book on page 429, you'll notice South Carolina's number one to leave the Union on December 20th, 1860. <clears throat> now, very quickly thereafter in January, Mississippi will follow, followed by Florida, Alabama, and so forth. They're all forming the Confederate States of America. They're going to form their own government, elect their own president, Jefferson Davis, and now by the time that Abraham Lincoln is sworn in in March, um, you can see seven states uh, have left the Union. So now it's just a matter of time before the outright battles of the Civil War begin in 1861. It'll start in April with the bombardment of Fort Sumter in South Carolina, a federal fort, and then the war is on. Now, when you look at how the two sides match up on paper, you'd think that the North would have ended this war very quickly, and a lot of people thought they would. They held advantages in every area. <clears throat> The North was industrialized. The North produced all the war materials. And in fact, if you look at the statistics, and I'm going to uh, post these in another handout online, 
These statistics down here, you'll see them later. <clears throat> the North has as many factories as the South has factory workers. The North has 110,000 factories in the industrialized North. The South, which is not industrialized, has a grand total of 110,000 people working in factories. Quite an advantage when you're making materials of war. Iron is another uh, implication of this industrialization. The North enjoys a 20 to 1 ratio in production of iron over the South. Now you might think, South has all the cotton, so at least they'll have uniforms. <laughs> no, they won't. They'll run out pretty quick. As far as making the textiles needed for uniforms, the North has a 17 to 1 ratio because all the textile factories are in the North. Now, we already looked at railroads. At the time of the Civil War, there are 22,000 miles of railroads in the North. There's only 9,000 miles of tracks in the South, and many of those are trunk lines, as I explained to you earlier. They go nowhere, just to a port city. And the biggest telling factor here, besides the North has a much larger population than the South, especially free population, is firearms. The North enjoys a 32 to 1 ratio in guns. With all these, you'd think, well, Civil War might last a year at best. It's going to drag on for four bloody years, and it's going to be the bloodiest war in American history. Three quarters of a million Americans, approximately, military and civilian, will die in the war because everyone who dies is an American. We're fighting ourselves. One area where the South has a distinctive advantage is generals. For some uncanny reason, all the really great generals during the Civil War were Southerners, like Robert E. Lee in Stonewall Jackson. Lee was from Virginia. He was offered the command of the Union Army by Abraham Lincoln in April of 1868, the same month his state left the Union. And he wrote back to Abraham Lincoln, I'm sorry, sir, I must go the way my state goes. And then he became the commander of the Southern Confederate Army. Abraham Lincoln struggled for years trying to find proper leadership for the highly superior Union Army. And he couldn't find it. He went through general after general, the worst being General McClellan, who was just horrible on the battlefield. Finally, towards the last year and a half of the war, he'll finally find Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman. Those two understand how to win a war, and they fight a war of attrition and grind the Confederacy into mincemeat. But it was a long time finding them, and the war really doesn't turn around until 1864. Now, I like to end this class up in the classroom, and luckily I have the handouts with me, or not handouts, but what I want to illustrate to you. This took a horrible toll on Abraham Lincoln. He blamed himself for this war, and the South didn't give him a chance. They started leaving the Union before he was even sworn in as president. And he also blamed himself for struggling to find proper leadership for his military. And boy, oh boy, did it take a toll on Abraham Lincoln. Here's a photograph of Abraham Lincoln when he was running for the presidency in 1860. Here's a photograph of Abraham Lincoln in, eight, in 1865, shortly before he was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth in April at the Ford Theater. Look at how much he aged in five years. He looks like an old man. This war took a toll on him, an unbelievable toll.
because he took it very personally. Abraham Lincoln was one of the greatest presidents, if not the greatest president ever. And boy, oh boy, did he put his life into his job. So, class, that's the end of our study in History 101. We got through the Civil War. Obviously, we don't have time to talk about a battle-by-battle battle replay. If you become American history majors later on, you can take a whole class on the Civil War. I know I did when I was a history major and loved every minute of it. So, it's been great teaching you this semester. Remember the final exams coming up. Uh, do a great job. And I want you all to, you know, pretty soon we're going to open up again, especially in the North Country, it appears. But we'll do it gradually and follow the orders. I wish you all the best health. And I hope you have a happy and safe summer. Take care, all. It's been a pleasure teaching you. Bye now.